But before we begin, dear listeners, let me warn you of two things. First, that this is a story without a hero. Second, that Vanity Fair is, its name indicates, a very vain, wicked, foolish place, full of all sorts of humbug and falseness and pretensions, as you will soon see for yourselves. As we bring our characters forward, I will ask leave not only to introduce them, but occasionally to step down from the platform and talk to you about them. If they're good and kindly, to love them and shake them by the hand. If they're wicked and heartless, to abuse them in the strongest terms which politeness admits of. And also to laugh at them confidentially in the listener's sleeve. For it was to combat and expose such as these, no doubt, that laughter was made. The Mole, Chillick, June 15, 1813. Madam, after her six years' residence at the Pickerton Academy for Young Ladies, I have the honor and happiness of presenting Miss Amelia Sedley to her parents as a young lady not unworthy to occupy a fitting position in their polished and refined circle. Those virtues which characterize the young English gentlewoman, those accomplishments which become her birth and station, will not be found wanting in the person of Miss Sedley. Though in geography there is still much to be desired, in music and dancing, in orthography, in every variety of embroidery and needlework, she will be found to have realized her friend's fondest wishes. In leaving the Pickerton Academy for young ladies, Miss Sedley carries with her the hearts of her companions and the affectionate regards of her mistress, who has the honor to subscribe herself, Madam, your most humble servant, Barbara Pinkerton. A P.S. Miss Rebecca Shop, an orphan, accompanies Miss Sedley. Goodbye. Goodbye, Miss Sedley. Right to me. Right to me. All ready to go, Miss Sedley. Goodbye, Miss Pinkett. Oh, here, Amelia. Here's a little something for the journey. It's some sandwiches. Oh, you may be hungry, you know. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Miss Pinkerton. Heaven bless you, my child. May you have all the happiness in life you deserve. Oh, thank you, Miss Pinkerton. And you too, Becky Sharp. May you... Don't you bless me, you old viper. What did you say? A viper and a fiddlestick. That's what you are. You took me because it was useful. You treated me like a servant. For four years, I've hated this place, and now I'm leaving it, and I'm glad. Goodbye! Rebecca, how could you say such things? Oh, I hate that place. I've never had a friend there or a kind word except from you, Amelia. I hope I may never set eyes on it again. I wish it were on the bottom of the Thames, I do. And if Miss Pinkerton were there, I wouldn't take her out. That I wouldn't. Rebecca! Oh, I should like to see her floating in the water yonder, <gasps> turban and all, with her train streaming after her Rebecca. and her nose like the beak of a query. Oh, for shame. <laughs> Why, how can you? How, how dare you have such wicked, revengeful thoughts? Revenge may be wicked, but it's natural. And I'm no angel. And to say the truth, she certainly was not. And though it might have been true, as Becky Sharp frequently said, that the world had used her ill, let me remind you, dear listeners, that persons whom the world treats ill usually deserve the treat they get. The world's looking glass gives back to every man the reflection of his own face. Frown at it, it looks sourly upon you. Laugh at it and with it, and it's a jolly kind companion. And so let all young persons take their choice. Now, to return to our heroine. Since Becky Sharp is, I'm ashamed to say, the heroine of this story, it must be admitted that she had not been fortunate in the choice of her parents. Her father was an artist with a great propensity for running into debt and a partiality for the tavern. It was from him, I believe, that she inherited her green eyes and her sandy hair. Her mother, a young woman of the French nation, was by profession an opera girl. From her, no doubt, she had her white hands and her delicate figure. The humble condition of her parents, Miss Sharp, Never alluded to. Indeed, as she advanced in life, her ancestors actually seemed to increase in rank and splendor. But we're running far ahead of our story. I've seen Becky this afternoon. His name is George. George Austin. He's the handsomest man you ever saw. Tall and slender, with a pale face and curly hair. Why, well, Becky, what's the matter? Becky, there are tears in your eyes. Oh, I'm sorry, Amelia. I hoped you wouldn't notice. Well, what is it, Rebecca? <laughs> I was thinking of your happiness, Amelia. And then a poor little me, all alone in the world. An orphan without friends or kindred. Not alone, Rebecca. I shall always be your friend and love you as a sister. Indeed, I will. Ah, but to have a beautiful home, Amelia, as you have. And parents, kind, rich, affectionate parents, who give you everything you ask for. And their love, which is more precious than all. I have no one. And I have but two frocks in the world. And then to have a brother, a dear brother. Oh, how you must love him. Oh, I do. I do indeed. Tell me about your brother, Amelia. He's been away so long, I don't know him very well. He lives in India, you know. India? Oh, then he must be very rich. They say that all Indian nabobs are enormously rich. Well, I believe he has a very large income. 
And is your sister-in-law a nice, pretty woman, dear Amelia? My sister-in-law? I have no sister-in-law. No sister-in-law? My brother Joseph is not married. Oh, indeed, your brother Joseph is not married. Tell me about him, Amelia. Tell me how he looks. Tell me what his tastes are. Tell me the things he likes to... Joe, see the way he gapes at her, like a fish. Dear brother Joe. Looks to me as though she had him hooked. Amelia, your little friend is wasting no time. George, dear, don't talk like about poor Becky. Ah, bravo, bravo. Thank, Thank you, you, Becky, that was charming. Uh-huh. Congratulations, Miss Sharp. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Made me cry almost. Upon the honor it did. Because you have a kind heart, Mr. Joseph. All the Sedleys have, I think. Wouldn't be surprised if it kept me awake all night trying to hum it in bed. <laughs> Oh, Oh, my dear Miss Sharp, allow me uh, one little teaspoonful of jelly to recruit you after your immense, uh, your delightful exertion. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. Is that jelly from India? It is. Brought it myself from Boggly Walla. Then it must be good, Mr. Joseph. I'm sure everything must be good that comes from India. Dear listeners, and more especially dear ladies... I know what you were thinking about Becky Sharp, and you were right. But before you blame her, remember that Miss Sharp had no kind parent who arranged these delicate matters for her, and if she didn't get a husband for herself, there was no one else in the wide world who'd take that trouble off her hands. So, ladies, be charitable. And now we come to a great evening in the history of our heroine. The evening when Mr. Joseph Sedley was to pop the question. Present were Miss Rebecca Sharp, Miss Amelia Sedley, her fiancé, Lieutenant George Osborne, her brother, Mr. Joseph Sedley, and a tall, silent gentleman of no particular importance called Captain William Dobbin. Everything seemed to smile that evening upon Becky's fortunes. She took Joseph's arm as a matter of course on going to dinner. She sat with Joseph in the box of his open carriage as they drew across Westminster Bridge towards Vauxhall Gardens. And it was with Joseph that she walked through the lamplit squares and heard the fiddlers play and watched the lady acrobats mount skyward on a slack rope ascending to the stars. Indeed, had it not been for a certain bowl of rack punch that was served that night for supper and of which Joseph partook immoderately... But let us draw a merciful veil over what happened then. Suffice to say that Joseph, in a very short time, drank up the whole contents bowl, the consequence of which was a liveliness, at first astonishing and then positively painful. Before he was finally put to bed, he had sung a song, fought two policemen, and publicly apostrophized Miss Becky Sharp as his diddle, diddle darling. The next morning, overcome with remorse, he left London for Cheltenham. Two days later, Miss Sharp, still single and in tears, left the home of her kind friend to take up a position of governess in the home of Sir Pitt Crawley Bart of Crawley Manor, Queen's Crawley, near Mudbury in Mudshire. My dearest, sweetest Amelia, with what mingled joy and sorrow do I take up the pen to write to my dearest friend. Yesterday I was at home in the sweet company of a sister whom I shall ever, ever cherish. Now I am friendless and alone. How is your dear fiancé? Lieutenant Osborne, we arrived here at Queen's Crawley this evening, Sir Pitt Crawley and I, only he's not a bit like a baronet, or rather not what we silly girls at school imagined a baronet must be like. Fancy a stumpy, short, vulgar, and very dirty old man in old clothes and shabby old gaiters who smoked a horrid pipe. All the servants came out with surly looks to welcome us into the biggest old house I've ever seen, which is not rendered less gloomy, I promise you, by having the shoes always shut. At dinner where we had nothing but watery mutton broth served in fine old silver dishes, I met my pupils, two sad, red-eyed little girls. After dinner, Sir Pitt went off to the kitchen with Horrocks the butler to get tipsy, I believe, and we sat around the table by the light of a single candle while young Mr. Crawley read us a long, dismal sermon on behalf of the mission for the Chickasaw Indians. At ten, we had prayers... In the main hall, all the servants and Sir Pitt somewhat the worst for... Oh, who is it? How dare you? Oh, Oh, Sir Pitt. Writing letters, eh, Miss Becky? Yes, sir. By the light of my candles, eh? Yes, sir. No candles after 11 o'clock, Miss Becky? Yes, sir. Go to bed in the dark now, you pretty little hussy. Unless you wish me to come for the candle every night, mind you be in bed at eleven. <laughs> Miss Amelia 
Treadley, Russell Square, London. I have not written to my beloved Amelia these many weeks past. For what interest could there be for her in the sayings and doings of Humdrum Hall, as I have christened Queen's Crawley? The pit is becoming more attentive every day, but what do you care about that? You who are so soon to become the bride of your loving, brilliant young soldier, Lieutenant Osborne. And now for the past week, dearest Amelia, it is Humdrum Hall no longer. Miss Crawley has arrived, the pit sister. Miss Crawley with her fat horses, fat servants, fat spaniel. The great Miss Crawley, rich, with 70,000 pounds in the 5%, whom, or I had better say which, her brother adores. She looks very apathetic to the dear soul. No wonder her brother is anxious about her. Becky Sharp? Yes, Miss Crawley? Come, you, my child, and sit by me and amuse me while my hair is being curled. Yes, Miss Crawley. Yes. You know, Becky, you, you have more brains than you have than the Shire now, I tell you. Oh, Miss Crawley. Oh, yes, if merit had its reward, you ought to be a chess. I wish you could come to see me in London. To London? Why, my dear, in London, we might even find you some law for a husband. A law, Miss Crawley? Why not? I adore all imprudent marriages. What I like best is for a nobleman to marry a milliner's daughter as Lord Flowerdale did. It makes all the women so angry. <laughs> That's what I'm always telling Rawdon. Rawdon? Who's he? He's my favorite nephew. You'll see him. Captain Rawdon Crawley of the King's Lagoon. He'll be here tomorrow. You know, I have quite set my heart on Rawdon running away with someone. A rich someone or a poor someone? Why, you goose, Rawdon is not a shilling but what I give him and what he'll get in my will. He's riddled with debts and the bailiff's after like dogs after a hare. When he marries, he must repair his fortune. Is he very clever, Miss Crawley? Clever, my love? Not an idea in the world, beyond horses and his regiment and his hunting and his play, but he must succeed. He's so delightfully wicked. He's adored in his regiment, and the young men at the cocoa tree simply swear by him. You just wait till you see him, my dear. Six foot two and a pair of mustachios. Oh, those stars, those stars, Captain Crawley. I feel myself almost a spirit when I gaze upon them. Oh, oh, God. Yes, so, so do I exactly, Miss Sharp. Oh, that's a beautiful waltz, I think. God, yes. First rate, first rate. Oh, it's beautiful out here in the garden, isn't it, Captain? By God, it is. Capital, capital. Uh, don't mind my guard, do you, Miss oh, Sharp? Oh, no, Captain, no. I love the smell of a cigar out of doors beyond everything in the world. Oh, it must be wonderful to be a man. Might I take a puff? A tiny, tiny puff. Glad you've got spirit, Miss Sharp. More <laughs> spirit than any woman I've ever met. And I've known some clippers. <laughs> there you are. Steady now. Oh, no. You must hold it for me. Oh. <coughs> <coughs> oh, that's not the way, my dear. Breathe in, not out, like this. Look. Oh, that's wonderful, Captain Crawley. Joe, <laughs> Gad, it's the finest cigar I ever smoked in the world. <laughs> Captain Crawley, how dare you? I have eyes, Miss Sharp. I've watched my father gaping at you, the old Shaw Bacon. But well, suppose he is fond of me. I know he is, and others too. You don't think I'm afraid of him, Captain Crawley. You don't suppose I can't defend my own honor. Oh, well, of course. I'm giving you fair warning, that's all. Look out, you know. You, you hit and hint at something not honorable, then? Oh, God, uh, really, Miss Rebecca. Do you suppose I have no feeling of self-respect, Captain Crawley, because I'm poor and friendless, and because rich people have none? Oh, I say, now, really, I... I Do you know. think because I'm a governess I have not as much sense and feeling and good breeding? As you gentle folks in hand. Oh, God, Becky, I, I didn't... I can I... endure poverty, but not shame. Neglect, but not insult. And insult from... From you, Rawdon. Oh, uh, hang it, Miss Sharp. <laughs> let me go. Rebecca. Oh, please let me go. Rebecca. <laughs> By Jove. I'm sorry. That Miss Crawley can't see you today. So much the better. I don't want to see her. No, how did you? I want to see Miss Becky. Me? Me, Sir Pitt? Miss Becky, I've heard my sister say she wanted you in London with her. Well, I won't have it. I want you here at Queen's Crawley, Miss. I want you here to stay. Poor, humble me, Sir Pitt. How could it matter to you whether I stay or go? I see it does. You must stay, dear Becky. Will you stay, Becky? Yes or no? 
Stay as what, sir? Stay as Lady Crawley, if you like. Lady Crawley? Stay and be my wife. You're a bit part. Mirth be hanged. You're as good a lady as ever I seen, Becky. Oh. Will he stay? Yes or no? Oh, don't know what to say. Say yes, Becky. Mm-hmm. I'd be old man, but a good'un. I'm good for 20 years. I'll make you happy. See if I don't. Uh-huh. You shall do what you like, spend what you like, and have it all your own way. I'll make you a settlement. I'll do everything regular. Oh, the pit is impossible. Look here. Down on me knees, I ask. But I can't, the pit. What, what do you mean, you can't? I lost. I can't. I can't. I'm, I'm already. What's this? Oh, What's oh, going oh. on? <gasps> on your knees, Sir Pitt? What are you doing there? Oh. Don't tell me you're proposing to Becky. Yes, I be. And? I thank Sir Pitt, madam, and told Can him... Can you refuse him? Yes. And am I to credit my ears that you absolutely proposed to her, Sir Pitt? Yes, I did. And she refused you, as she says? Yes, sir, did. <gasps> Pray, Miss Sharp, are you waiting for the Prince Regent's divorce that you don't think our family good enough for you? Oh, Miss Crawley, how can you speak to me that way? Oh, my friend. Oh, it's too much. My heart is too full. Brother, let me speak to her alone. <laughs> All right, I'll go. I'll go. <laughs> now, my dear. Yes, Miss Crawley? Now, tell me the truth. You'd never have refused him had there not been someone else in the case. <sighs> Come on, now, tell me the reasons. What are the private reasons? Why did you refuse him? I refused him because... I refused him because... Yes, yes, go on, because... Because I am married already. Married? Oh, you sly little wretch. How dared you not tell me? Goodness gracious, what a thing to do. And who's to make my chocolate in the morning? Who are you married to? I'm married to... Oh, how can you ever give me... Oh, stop blubbering, you foolish thing. I'm not going to eat you. Now then, tell me. Speak at once. Don't drive me mad. Madam, I am married to your nephew. To my... To Captain Rawdon Crawley. Rawdon Crawley? Yes, last week, madam. By the rector at Mudbury. Rawdon, answer you! Oh, a governess? A nobody? Why, you scheming, treacherous, ungrateful, deceitful hussy. What you get my money? Eh? Well, you won't. I'll check my will tomorrow. Not one penny do you hear? Not one penny for either of you. And you tell him this for me, my precious nephew, your husband. Then I wash my hands of him, do you hear? I never want to see him again as long as I live. And when you starve, the two of you, which you will, and the bailiff stand at the door, don't come to me because I won't raise a finger to help you, do you hear? Not a thing. Now get out! Get out! Get out! Thus far, dear listener, our chronicle has been a milk and water one dealing with the face of modest people. Now, suddenly our surprise story finds itself for a moment among very famous events and personages and hanging on to the skirts of history. Napoleon has escaped from Elba. Once again, his eagles are perched on the towers of Notre Dame. And so for a while, with your permission, we take you traveling across the English Channel from Dover to Ostend and from Ostend to Brussels. Never since the days of Darius the Meat was there such a brilliant train of camp followers as hung around the Duke of Wellington's army in the Low Countries that summer and led it, dancing and feasting as it were, up to the very brink of battle. A certain ball, which a noble duchess gave at Brussels on the 15th of June, is historical. Among the much-coveted invitations that went out on that occasion, there are three that are of special interest to us. They bear the names of Lieutenant and Mrs. George Osborne, you know them, of course. Captain and Mrs. Rawdon Crawley, you know them, too. And Captain William Dobbin, a tall, silent gentleman with large feet, whom you've met before, if you remember, in Vauxhall Gardens, and whom I described to you then, and described to you now again as a gentleman of no particular importance. Since that night in Vauxhall, a year has passed, many things have happened, and much has changed. So now, dear listeners, we're in Brussels at the Duchess of Richmond's ball where Amelia, knowing nobody, was a not a failure, while Mrs. Rawdon's Crawley's debut was, on the contrary, very brilliant. Oh, Mrs. Crawley, may I have the pleasure? Our dance, I believe, Miss Crawley. Ask Mrs. Crawley. Mrs. Crawley, if you remember, you promised oh, me... Oh, you dear, dear men, you're spoiling me, every one of you, and I'm going to disappoint you but all. Mrs. Crawley, you just promised. Later, promise. later, my dears, later, perhaps. Just now, I must go and sit over there with my poor little Amelia husband. Amelia, my darling. Good evening, Rebecca. My oh, dear Amelia, what is the matter? Aren't you ashamed sitting here all by yourself? Such a delightful ball, too, don't you think? Everybody's here. Everybody, but everybody knows, I mean. Indeed, there are only a few nobodies in the whole room. Amelia, dear, where is your husband? What a wretch he is, leaving you all alone with this. I really must talk to him about it. No, please. Please don't. Oh, and that reminds me, Amelia, darling, there is something you really must talk to him about. I? Yes, my dear, for heaven's sake, stop him from gambling or he'll ruin himself. He and Rob are playing at cards every night in 
and you know how poor George played. I didn't know George. Indeed, what? it's your fault as much as anybody. How could it be? Oh, why don't you prevent him, you silly, careless creature? Why don't you go out with George of an evening when he comes to us instead of moping at home? Aren't you lonely? Why, yes. I... Oh, I. Uh... I hear that friend of your husband's, Captain William Dobbin, keeps you company while George is out. Oh, oh here he comes now. George, you wretch, where have you been? Here's Emmy crying her eyes out for uh, you. I'm sorry, Amelia. Oh, I know, George. You've come to fetch me for the quadrille. George, I'm not feeling very well. I'd like to go home soon. Right after this dance, Amelia. Oh, darling, Amelia, you sit here quietly and feel better after a time. We won't be long, will we, George? George Osborne danced with Rebecca four or five times that evening. How many times Amelia scarcely knew. She sat quite unnoticed in her corner until Captain William Dobbin made so bold as to bring her refreshments and sit beside her for a time. He did not know what to say to her because of the tears which he saw filling her eyes. At last, George came back for Rebecca's shawl and flowers and Amelia let him come and go without saying a word. Went away with a bouquet and when he gave it to its owner, there lay a note coiled in it like a snake among the flowers. As Rebecca took it, she gave George a quick glance and then she made a curtsy and walked away on her husband's arm. After she'd gone, George looked around for Amelia, could not see her, and then at that moment... Gentlemen! 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 Words just reached us from the Duke of Wellington's headquarters. The enemy is advancing! Our left wing is already engaged! All regiments march in one hour! The sun was rising as the regiment began to march. Among them, the seventh of the line. It was a gallant sight. The band led the column, then marched the grenadiers, their captain at their head, in the center with the colors borne by the senior and junior ensigns, and then George came marching at the head of his company, looked up and smiled at Amelia. The Battle of Waterloo had been won, and darkness came down on the field and city. On Becky Sharp, who, profiting by a rumor of an English defeat, had just sold husband's horses for 500 pounds apiece, and on Amelia, who was praying for George, who was lying on his face, dead with a bullet through his heart. You are listening to Orson Welles in the Campbell Playhouse presentation of Vanity Fair, starring Helen Hayes in the role of Becky Sharp. Now we resume our Campbell Playhouse presentation of Van Fair, starring Helen Hayes and Orson Welles. We now come to a part of our history which might be called How to Live Well on Absolutely Nothing a Year, for that is exactly what the characters of our story are doing at this moment. Those that aren't dead already. Amelia Osborne, with her little boy, has been living for some years now in a cottage in Camden Hill on a tiny income, augmented, though of course she doesn't know this, by the kindness of her dead husband's friend. Captain William Dobbin, whom you have met. As to our heroine, and I know she's the one you really want to hear about, I can only tell you this. But by the time our story finds her again, Rebecca and her husband had established themselves in a small but very comfortable house on Curzon Street, Mayfair. How she did it, I cannot tell you. But you saw expensive chariots at her door. You beheld her carriage in the park, surrounded by dandies of note. And the little box in the third tier of the opera was crowded with heads constantly changing. There was, it is true, one head which for some months past had not changed, and which was not the head of her husband, Rawdon Crawley. It was a head which was to be seen quite frequently of an afternoon in the little house on Curzon Street. It was a bald head which shone under the candles, and it was fringed with red hair. It had bushy eyebrows with little twinkling bloodshot eyes surrounded by a thousand wrinkles. Its jaw was underslung, and when it laughed, two white buck teeth protruded themselves and glistened savagely in the midst of the grin. Stane, dear, dear Lord Stane, you will forgive me. A poor man's wife must make herself useful, you know. 
I was in the kitchen making a pudding. I know you were. I saw you through the area railings as I drove up. You see everything, Lord Stillman. A few things, but not that, my pretty lady. You silly little fibster. I oh. heard you in the room overhead, where I have no doubt you were putting a little rouge on. And I heard the bedroom door open, and then you came downstairs. Is it a crime to try to look my mm. best when you come here? <laughs> Perhaps not. <laughs> Surely it's the least I can do after what came from you this morning. Oh, how can I ever thank you, uh, my lord? <laughs> you mean the... Uh, I won't miss them, my dear. They give you pleasure. Where's your husband, my dear? Oh, out at some club gambling again, mm. I expect. He's out so much, he leaves me so much alone. So uh, convenient of him, isn't it, my dear? Mm. I've been thinking, Becky, about what you asked me last night. Do you still wish it? My lord, you know I do. You little devil, you. You're really bent on becoming a fine lady, and you'll pester my poor old life out to get you to society. My lord, I mean <laughs> For what? You won't be able to hold your own there, you silly little fool. You've got no money. It's not half so nice as here. You'll be bored there. Oh, no, my lord. I am. My wife mm. is as gay as Lady Macbeth, and my daughter's as cheerful as Regan and Goneril. Oh, well, see for yourself. You'll be invited next week. Only I warn you, look out and hold your own, and beware of the women. Refuse to have that woman in the house. My lady Stane, I ask you once more, will you have the goodness to go to that desk and write an invitation to Mr. and Mrs. Rodden Crawley? Oh, Lord, I will not be present. I will leave this house. I wish you would. I'd be free of your blasted tragedy airs. Who are you to give orders here? You've got no money, got no brains. There's no one in this house who doesn't wish you a debt. I wish I were. That's beside the point. Tell me, are you going to send that invitation to my young friend, Mrs. Crawley? You strike me if you like, but you shall not make me receive that woman. Lady Stane, I am a gentleman and never lay my hand upon a woman save in a way of kindness. I only wish to correct little faults in your character. You mustn't give yourself airs. For all you know, this calumnated, simple, good-humored Mrs. Crawley is quite innocent, even more innocent than yourself, perhaps. Oh. Remember, my dear, this temple of virtue belongs to me, and if I invite all Newgate or all Bethlehemia, by heaven, they shall be welcome! <laughs> By Jove, Beck, you're fit to be Commander-in-Chief or Archbishop of Canterbury. By Jove. What are you talking about, Rodden? You've done it, Beck. How do you feel now? The daughter of a painting master and an opera girl invited out to one of the greatest houses in England. Gad, Becky, you're a wonder. I say, Beck, you're looking wonderful tonight. Oh, thank you. Pink always was your color. And I say, Beck, where'd you get those? Gad, they look like diamonds. What? Uh, yes, they're diamonds. Well, I'm dashed if I can see well. Where do you suppose I got them, you old goose? <laughs> I hired them. <laughs> From Mr. Polonius on Carpenter Square. You don't suppose that all the diamonds that go to the court belong to the wearers, do you? Gordon, do you have to smoke that filthy cigar in here? Oh, filthy, eh? I remember when you liked them well enough. That was when I was on my promotion, Goosey. Now go on, get dressed, hurry. Ah, uh, Gad Beck, you're wonderful. I'll make our fortune yet, you old booby. By Jove, I believe you will. It's not my intention, dear listener, to describe to you here the brilliant and fashionable entertainment that was given in the Marquis of Stain's splendid house on that fateful evening. Further details, if you wish them, may be found in the society glets of the period. What famous persons were present, what they wore, what they ate, and what they did to amuse themselves. This I promise you. Whatever account of that evening's reception you happen to read, you'll be struck by one thing, that among all the grand names that were present that night, and half London was there, and half the embassies and celebrities of Europe, one name occurred again and again. A name unknown until this evening to that particular class of London society. The name of Mrs. Rawdon Crawley. The Marquis of Stain was her slave, followed her everywhere, and scarcely spoke to anyone in the room besides. She passed by Lady Stunnington with a look of scorn. She patronized Lady Gaunt and Lady Tapeworm. At supper time, she was placed at the grand exclusive table with His Royal Highness. She was served on gold plate, and when the hour of departure came, a crowd of young men followed her cheering to her carriage, thereby quite separating her from her escort, Colonel Rawdon Crawley. So completely separating her indeed that it was not until late the following afternoon that she had news of him. Dear Becky, I hope you slept well. Don't be frightened if I don't bring you in your chocolate this morning. 
Last night, as I was coming home, I was nabbed by Moss of Cursitor Street. You remember the same bailiff that had me this time two years ago. It's Nathan's got a warrant against me. 150, with costs 170. Please send me my wallet and some clothes. I mean pumps and a white tie. I have 70 in it. And as soon as you get this, drive to Nathan's. Offer him 75 down and ask him to renew. God bless you, Beck. Yours in haste, Rodden. Uh, P.S. Make haste and come back, dear. Rodden, my poor darling monster. You may fancy my state when I read your poor, dear, old, ill-felt letter. Ill as I was, I instantly called for the carriage, and as soon as I was dressed, though I couldn't drink a drop of chocolate, I assure you I couldn't without my own darling monster to bring it to me, I drove like the wind to Nathan. I saw him, I wept, I cried, I fell at his odious knees. Nothing would mollify the horrid man. He would have all the money, he said, or keep my poor darling monster in prison. When I got home, I found my lord there, and down on my knees I went again. He pished and shod in a fury and said he would see whether he could lend me the money. At last he went away, promising that he would send it to me in the morning when I will bring it to my poor old monster with a kiss from his affectionate Becky. I am writing in bed. Oh. When Rawdon read all this letter, he turned so red and looked so savage that his companions in the jail easily perceived that bad news had reached him. Then he had an interview with his jailer. What was said at that interview? What promises were made? What undertakings given? I cannot tell you. What I can tell you is that a little before nine that evening, Rawdon Crawley left the jail. He ran across the streets and the great squares of Vanity Fair and at length came up breathless in front of his own house. The drawing room windows were ablaze with light. He stood there for some time, the light from the rooms on his pale face. He took out his door key and let himself into the house. He went silently up the stairs. Nobody was stirring. All the servants had been sent away. I'm glad you're pleased, my lord. Uh, uh, beautiful, Becky, like you. Beautiful and, and desirable. <laughs> Rodden! Hey, come back. How, how you do, Crawley? What is this man doing here? Rodden, I'm innocent. Before God, I'm innocent. My lord, say I'm innocent. You? Innocent? Oh. Uh, blast you. The trap set by the two of you, fine pair. Oh, no. You innocent why? Every trinket you have on your body made for by me. I've given you thousands of pounds which this fellow has spent and for which he is he sold you. You lie innocent by God. Don't think you can frighten me as you have the others. You lie, you can't. Make way, sir, and let me pass. Get out! Rodden. Come here. Yes, Rodden. Take off those things. Yes, of course. Throw them down. Well, Rodden, what are you going to do? I want to see if that man has lied about the money as he has about me. Has he given you any? No. Uh, that is... Give me your keys. Where are they? They're on the desk. Oh, Rodden. Rodden. Oh, so it's the truth. You've been hiding these these notes. This money for months, for years. Rodden, I was afraid. Look at this. One thousand pounds. Did he give you this? Yes. I'll send it back to him tonight. With the rest, I'll pay a few of our debts. Rodden, I'm innocent. I tell you, I'm innocent. One month to a day following the Marquis of Staines' party, Colonel Rawdon Crawley left London to take a post in the colonies. His wife left London some weeks later for the continent. She was in Paris that winter and the following year in Rome. She was in Berlin two years later. She received the news of her husband's death and the last of the modest allowance which he had regularly sent her for his colonial appointment. That summer she was seen in Vienna, and after that she was heard of no more. And now, dear listeners... We near the end of our chronicle. One more sight of our friends and we're done. A happy ending and our story is over. But before that, 
we must go traveling once more together, this time with Colonel William Dobbin and his party to the little, comfortable, ducal town of Pumpernickel in southern Germany. We have arrived with carriage and courier at the Elbrinz Hotel, the best in town, and the whole party is downing downstairs. Everybody remarks at the majesty of Mr. Joseph Sedley, recently returned from India, now somewhat portly and red of face, and the knowing way in which he sips, or rather sucks his wine. As to Colonel William Darbin himself, you remember him surely, for you've met him before in our story, a gentleman with uh, long legs, uh, a pale face, very large hands and feet, which at first seem rather ridiculous, but his thoughts are just, his brains uh, fairly good, his heart honest and pure, his life warm and humble, and he's loved Amelia for 15 years. After dinner, Amelia, the boy, and Colonel William Darbin go to the opera. Brother Joseph, being less musical, proceeds to the casino where a roulette game is in progress. The play games are crowded. Women are playing, some of them masked, and behind the masks, the eyes twinkle. Some blue, some brown, some green. Monsieur, madame, pet pour jeu. Pet pour jeu. Monsieur, yes, you, monsieur. What? What's that? Will you do me a little favor, monsieur? What is it? Sit down beside me, please, monsieur, and give me good luck. Oh, really? Well, now, heaven bless my soul, I am very fortunate, as a matter of fact. I'm sure to give you good fortune. Monsieur, madame, faites vos jeux. Rien va plus. Ah, please, what did oh, I say oh, to you? Oh, thank you, monsieur. Do you play much, monsieur? Oh, I put down a nap or two now and then. Ah, I understand. You don't play to win. <laughs> no more do I. I play to forget, but I cannot. I cannot forget old times. Everybody changes. Everybody forgets. Nobody has any heart. But you. You have not changed much, Joseph Sedley. Good heavens. <laughs> what are you talking about? I should have known you anywhere. There are things a woman never forgets. I say, who is it? Who are you? Can't you guess? Without my mask, perhaps? Have you forgotten me, Joseph? Good heavens, Miss Sharp. <laughs> Rebecca. That evening, from his window in the hotel, Colonel Dobbin witnessed the arrival of Mrs. Becky and her meager luggage. He saw Amelia come out to greet her. Colonel Dobbin saw where his duty lay. Mrs. Dobbin, how nice it is to see you. Or rather, Colonel, I believe it is now. I beg Do you your remember, pardon, Mrs. Crawley. I am bound to tell you it is not as your friend that I am come here. Mrs. Dobbin, keep your southern tongue. Amelia, you intend to have Mrs. Crawley in your house? Dear poor Rebecca, after all her suffering, all her friends false to her, her husband, wicked, deceitful wretch, having deserted her and taken the child away but from Amelia, her. But Amelia, the, the woman never had a child. I will not have this sort of thing in my house. I say, Dobbin, I will not have it, and I... Your friend, do hear what Colonel Dobbin has to say against me. I will not hear it, blasted. <laughs> now we are two women. You can speak now, sir. I assure you, Amelia, this is not a pleasant duty. But a lady who was separated from her husband, who travels not under her own name who frequents public gaming tables... I swear it was the first time in my life. ...is not a fit companion for Mrs. Osborne and her son. I may add, there are people in this town who know you, Mrs. Crawley, and who profess to know things regarding your conduct, about which I don't even wish to speak before Mrs. Osborne. May I remind you, Colonel Dobbin, that Rebecca is my oldest friend. She was not always your friend, Amelia. I remember a night in Brussels Colonel when... Dobbin, to allude to that, oh, it was cruel of you. Is that all you have to say against me, Colonel Dobbin? Yes, that is all, hmm. A very modest and convenient sort of accusation, Colonel Dobbin. An accusation that remains unspoken. What is it that I'm accused of? Is it of being poor, faken, or wretched that you accuse me? Oh, my poor Rebecca. No, let me go, Amelia. Now at once. It is better so. It is only to suppose that I have not met you and I am no worse today than I was yesterday. It is only to suppose that the night is over and the poor wanderer is on her way, scorned for being miserable... And insulted because I am alone. <laughs> Let me go. I see my stay here interferes with the plans of this gentleman. Indeed it does, madam. If I have any authority in this house. Authority? None. Rebecca, you stay with me. I won't desert you because you've been persecuted or insulted or because... Because Colonel Dobbin chooses to do so. Come away, dear. If he will not go, 
We will. Amelia. Amelia, will you stay a moment and speak to me? He wishes to speak to you away from me, Amelia. On my oath, madam, it is not about you that I'm going to speak. Oh, come back, Amelia. I guess you'd better, Amelia. Well? I was confused when I spoke just now, and I misused the word authority. You did? At least, Amelia, I have claims to be heard. It's very generous, isn't it? To remind me of our obligations to you. The claims, I mean, are those left to me by George's father. Yes. And you insulted his memory. You did just now. You know you did. And I'll never forgive you. Never. Do you mean that, Amelia? Yes, I do. Amelia, I have loved you and watched over you for 15 years. For 15 years in vain. I know now what your heart is capable of. It can cling faithfully to a recollection and cherish a fancy. But it can't feel such an attachment as mine deserves to mate with. Goodbye, Amelia. I have watched your struggle. Let it end. We are both weary of it. Am I to understand in the... that you're going away? Away, William? Yes, Amelia, I am going away. Forever? Yes, Amelia, forever. Oh, no, you're not. Becky, you haven't been listening at keyholes? Oh, yes, indeed, I have all my life. Now then, Amelia, you come here and listen to me while I tell you the truth for a change. It's time somebody did, you little idiot. You're no more fit to live in the world by yourself than a baby in arms. You must marry... Or you and your precious boy will go to ruin. You must have a husband, you fool. And one of the best gentlemen I've ever seen has offered you his hand and you've rejected him. And tonight you've lost him. You silly, heartless, ungrateful little creature. Oh, but I've tried, Rebecca. <laughs> I've tried to love him. Indeed, I have. But I couldn't. I couldn't forget. Forget? Forget whom? Him, Rebecca. My darling. My poor dead George. You couldn't forget him? <laughs> Oh, don't make me laugh. <laughs> that selfish humbug. That low-bred cockney dandy. Rebecca. That padded booby. Who had neither faith nor manners nor heart. Oh. And was no more to be compared with your friend with the big feet than you are to Queen Elizabeth. Becky. Why, the man was weary of you and would have jilted you. But oh. the Dobbin forced him to keep his word. He told me so. Oh. He never cared for oh. you. He used to sneer about you to me time after time. And he made love to me the week after he married oh, you. it's false. <laughs> it's false, Rebecca. False, is it? Look here. Look at this note. You've seen it before. Oh, oh, you should have. It was in that bouquet he gave me at the Duchess of Richmond's ball. Go on, read it. Open it. You know his handwriting. Oh. <laughs> he wrote that to me. Wanted me to run away with him. Gave it to me right under your nose, you little fool. <laughs> that night before he went out to get shot. <laughs> and it served him right. <laughs> Three days later, they were married. Goodbye, Colonel. God bless you, honest William. Farewell, dear Amelia. So, there you are. You have your happy ending, dear listener. And with that, we're almost done. And Joseph Sedley did not return to England with Darwin and Amelia. The air of the continent, he declared, was necessary for his health. So also, apparently, was the presence of Mrs. Rebecca Crawley who was seen in his company during the next few years in various watering places of northern Europe. He died suddenly one day at Aix-la-Chapelle, leaving his entire property, including a substantial life insurance he had recently taken out, to his friend and invaluable attendant during sickness, uh, Rebecca Crawley, or Lady Crawley, as she now calls herself. She's returned to England and chiefly hangs about Bath and Cheltenham, where many excellent people consider her to be a most injured woman. She has her enemies... Who has not? Her life is her answer to them. She busies herself in works of piety. She goes to church and never without a footman. Her name is on all the charity lists. The destitute orange girl, the neglected washerwoman, the distressed muffin man, find in her a fast and generous friend. And so, farewell, dear listener. Vanitas vanitatum. Who of us is happy in this world? Which of us has his desire, or having it is satisfied? Come. Let's shut up the box and the puppets, for our play is play out. 